GFANS was a big deal. This is basically asset managers, financial services coming together to do their bit. You've been adding members. I think in total you have, what, $150 trillion um, dollars under assets of the members. Can you all really bring them forward together to, to, to make it better for the world? Well, I th that's the commitment of each of the individual institutions, institutions that span over 50 countries around the world and the entire uh, waterfront of uh, finance. Their commitment is to move those assets towards financing uh, one and a half degrees. Now, like anything in finance, some will be more successful than others. There'll be leaders and laggards. And part of what we're doing is providing a common framework for them to move and then very importantly, and I'm on Bloomberg, so I've got to say this, it's about the data. Uh, and big announcement around uh, a data platform so that everybody, everyone watching, the sophisticated watchers of Bloomberg, but any stakeholder uh, can look and see, well, how's the bank doing? Uh, what are its emissions? What were its targets? Is it meeting its targets? Uh, and then uh, and then providing the pressure or the support as appropriate. But this, this would be data also that works between jurisdictions, right? Absolutely. That's operational. Yeah. Otherwise, it's useless. Why yeah. are we still talking about data in 2022? Well, we're talking, well, first off, uh, we need to bring data on a common uh, standard. So, look, two years ago when we started this COP journey, if I can put it that way, at least I started this COP journey, um, you had less than a third of the world's assets or, or GDP and emissions were uh, subject to net zero targets. Nobody was really counting in a comprehensive and systematic way the emissions of a financial institution, let alone a company in its whole supply chain. Now everyone's committed to do that, or not everyone, but the bulk of people have committed to do it. Over 90% of global emissions now covered, and so that process is happening. Question is, what you're asking is, how do we then bring it together in a simple, uh, machine-readable, uh, easy-to-access way that everyone can see Apples to apples comparisons, and then make judgments accordingly, and that's what we're that's what we're doing. I mean, the, the last 12 months have really changed economics, inflation, the cost of living, and energy in general. D does it mean that we need to lower ambitions to make sure that everyone's still included in finance, so that they, they get together on this, or do you need no. to be still as aggressive as no, 12 we months need to ago? Be, I mean, uh, climate physics doesn't uh, respect why emissions are happening; just the amount of uh, emissions. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is. You know, we're seeing that a lot of the answer to energy security problems that have been exposed by Russia's illegal war have to do with sustainability. That's why you've seen a five-fold increase um, in the ambition in the European Union for this decade. That's why you've seen the big rollout uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in the United States. You know, building out local wind, local solar, hydrogen, which is coming on uh, market fast, these are solutions to not just climate issues, but geopolitical issues. But so where's the smart money in finance going to actually make sure that, uh, that there, this there, goes? There, there are two ways the smart money is going. The first is there's an absolute wall of opportunity uh, in just rolling out clean energy at scale. I'll give you one fact. I work at Brookfield part-time, um, and we have gone from 20 gigawatts in our pipeline of building out renewables to over 100 in just 12 months. That gives you a sense of how fast things are moving. The second place, though, is looking at every single company and figuring out who has a plan within a sector, it doesn't matter which sector or which regions, who has a plan to get their emissions down. If they're going to get their emissions down, and faster than their peers, they're going to unlock value. And it's that level of sophistication that we're helping to unlock with these plans. What do you need today from world leaders to, to make it easier? No, I think you were on a panel with Manuel Macron yesterday, Al Gore. It seems that, that you know private companies are, are starting on this trend quite aggressively. Is there something that, that um, governments can do, either make it mandatory or just give more of a framework that would help private money? Well, the first thing, yes, uh, governments should make it mandatory, as you know, with climate disclosure. It's, it's actually taken seven years for governments to make it mandatory from COP21 yeah. in Paris uh, to uh, effectively today. Uh, we shouldn't wait, so we can't wait seven years for uh, transition planning. Second thing is in and around nature. I was on that panel yesterday, uh, President Macron and others, and it was about, uh, the Finnish Prime Minister, it was about nature and, and how we can be part of the solution, not all of the solution, but part of the solution there. Much clearer policies from governments and financial institutions can unlock that value. Last point, if I may, there's a huge opportunity for finance to go from, you know, advanced economy uh, companies, some of the wealthiest companies and financial institutions in the world, to nature-based solutions and the accelerated shutdown of coal in places like Egypt. Big announcement coming out of Egypt today, uh, consistent with that, and we'll see more on the balance of the week. What are the green
finance capitals of the world. Is London still one of them? Uh, London is absolutely one of them. Uh, Singapore is making a big effort uh, on that as well. Uh, I would put both of those out in front. I was in Hong Kong last week, and their intention is there. Um, and, you know, in the end, this is going to mainstream, but those financial capitals that get it and get it early are going to help set the terms. And, you know, it's an agglomeration game. We all know from financial services. Uh, so, yes, London's been out ahead. And, you know, the then Chancellor, now Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said a year ago, uh, we're going to make London uh, the world's first net zero financial center. That's smart. That's good business and obviously good for the planet. I know you hate talking about UK economics and the Bank of like England. Public, so let I me ask like you. <laughs> so let me ask you about it live on TV. Okay. I mean, what happens? <laughs> How should markets look at what they've you know lived through in the last two months? Well, I mean, uh, there's a number of lessons there, importance of institutions, importance of monetary policy and fiscal policy working uh, you know, in the same direction. Uh, the challenges we're all going to see in financial stability as monetary policy continues to tighten. Uh, the UK, like other jurisdictions, has particularly difficult problems on the supply side. You know, I've made the point, and I'll make it again, that it's been exacerbated, made worse by Brexit. So it's a tougher balancing act uh, for the Bank of England. Um, look, what we're dealing with here at COP is a longer-term issue that we need to deal with today, but we'll pay medium-term dividends, medium-term dividends in making economies more competitive, financial services centers more competitive, but actually, as well, near-term uh, dividends in terms of investments, jobs, and growth in a very difficult environment. But is there a danger that our central banks are distracted, let's say, put it diplomatically, about inflation, everything that's going on, that they'll do less, for example, for greening the economy? Of course, I have a very high opinion of central bankers, as you'd expect. And they're able to do two things at one time. That's one of the uh, roles in your your life, uh, in the life of a policymaker. Um, there's a, a dedicated uh, commission, committee for uh, monetary policy. MPC gets up, thinks that's all it thinks about is inflation, what they can do about inflation. There are other committees in the Bank of England, Financial Policy Committee, uh, and the, the one that oversees the banks, plus a bunch of people who can provide some of the plumbing some of the plumbing, not all of the plumbing, to get this net zero financial center in place. And the key thing, I'd, I'd go back to GFANS if I may, yeah. what we're providing on a voluntary basis is the rest of the plumbing, and plumbing that's focused on opportunity, grabbing investment, going, backing companies, entrepreneurs, innovators to get those emissions down, and in the process, not just manage risk, obviously you got to manage risk, yeah. but really unlock the value you're asking about. Talking about the plumbing, do you worry about liquidity in the markets? I, uh, what, yes. I mean, because of what, shadow banking? I mean, when you take away the tide of cheap money, what are you left with? Yeah, look, um, I, I alluded to that earlier, without yeah. question. Um, we're in a uh, market where collateral is going to be increasingly scarce. That's having knock-on effects on liquidity. It's hard to predict exactly when, but you get these jump to Ill illiquidity situations, and as a portfolio manager, as as a bank, as a market participant, you have to plan for what is a very fat tail risk. Um, and as we've seen over the last few years, that tail risk can manifest in the most liquid, otherwise most liquid markets in the world. U.S. Treasuries, uh, gilts is two examples. And certainly as you get farther afield, expect, expect to see it. So pricing for illiquidity. Another point I would add, which we haven't seen yet, is, look, my view, we're moving to a medium term where we, yes, we have higher inflation on average. We certainly have higher volatility around inflation, and we should have, you should get paid for that as an investor. You should get a term premium uh, on longer term debt, and I'm looking at uh, the 10 year today. It doesn't really have much of a term premium in it, even at 4.2 percent. What it has in it is an expected path of uh, Fed funds rate in the near term. Which but is wrong. Well, I'm, I'm not saying it's necessar that's necessarily wrong. What's missing is that this path does not magically return to the very low rates uh, of before. Uh, look, on the balance, do I think the Fed's going to have to do a bit more? Yes, I'd put myself in the camp of that. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. It's not a decision they need to take today. Let's get the, see how the data is through. My sense is momentum and inflationary pressures in the U.S. economy are, are still quite significant. What does this mean for the rest of the world? When we talk about financing yeah. for, you know, African countries because of loss and damage. This, again, links it back to the funding and the debt crisis they're dealing with because of high dollar. Yeah, it means a few things. And one of them is that we're going to be, yes, in a higher interest rate environment over the medium term. I mean, for sake of argument, don't, don't hold me to this, but think of a 5% 10-year U.S. Treasury on which financing for Egypt, for South Africa, to pick two uh, very prominent ones here, is priced off of. So that becomes, you know, considerably expensive with the risk premium. And, and part of the question is, 
how do we de-risk elements, how do we collectively de-risk elements of the big ramp-ups in clean energy that have to happen there. Uh, we need our international financial institutions to work much better. We need that wall of money, which is what GFANS is, is an absolute enormous wall of money to become more familiar with these markets and develop in these markets. We need markets like carbon uh, uh, credit markets to truly develop. Lots of headlines about them. A carbon price, yeah, in, in individual jurisdictions it would be nice. I don't hold my breath uh, for a carbon price. Those are deep, uh, you know, they work when they come in, but there's, there's deep politics with them and, uh, and we won't see a global carbon price anytime soon.